So um, I gave you, oops, I gave you some examples of CWF so far, but now we're going to come to the real interesting case of the pre-sheaf models. Some groupoid models is actually quite interesting already, but pre-sheaf models are a very, very powerful tool. So it's a way of interpreting type theory into any pre-sheaf category. And uh, it's, um, it's a so-called extensional interpretation, which um, well, extensional meant a kind of different thing uh, some time ago. Nowadays, people say univalence is an extensionality principle, but people used to say that equality reflection is an extensionality principle. So here uh, we mean actually models that support equality reflection, which just means that the uh, identity type in the type theory is interpreted as actual metatheoretic equality. So the actual equality in, in our life. <laughs> or I always want to say life when I say mathematics, but I guess it means I don't have any life outside mathematics. Um, so it's useful because pre-shift categories are so useful. They appear everywhere in modern mathematics. And um, constructions and pre-shift categories can easily get out of hand if you work if you do many, many things in succession. So we can kind of exploit um, the brevity of type theory that, um, well, sometimes it's brief, sometimes not so much, but we can use it as a tool for speaking about constructions and pre-sheaves. And this doesn't yet have anything to do with univalence. It's, it's a technique which is, which is decades old, it's, it's not new. And um, one example application is actually a circular application, namely we can use pre-sheaf categories to describe type formers in CWFs themselves. So we can use the language of extensional type theory in pre-sheaves to describe what it means for a CWF to have certain type formers so that we don't have to constantly mention the context gamma anymore and say that everything that we postulate is supposed to be stable under substitution in gamma or natural in gamma. So that's kind of nice. But more importantly for this talk, um, pre-sheaf models are bootstrapping devices for the models of homotopy type theory that we are going to be interested in the end. So we are going to use the interpretation of the universe, pi types, sigma types of these pre-sheaf models and just modify them a tiny bit so that they, they become good models for homotopy type theory. So usually this involves restricting the types in some way. Um, usually a type in a pre-sheaf model basically just corresponds to a an arbitrary map into the current context. Um, so there's kind of an equivalence between maps into the context and types over context in the pre-sheaf models. And um, for the homotopy uh, type theory models, we usually restrict this by adding some sort of vibration condition to this so-called display map. And uh, the pi types and sigma types are actually interpreted as before. We just have to provide weaknesses that um, the pi type or sigma type is also vibration. And the universe is a more complicated story. So um, here I've given a definition, one definition of uh, pre-sheaf models, and it is not the standard definition. And I did this intentionally. So uh, C hat is just our notation for pre-sheaf categories as before. And I'm going to say a type over gamma is a discrete vibration over the category of elements of gamma. So usually um, you would say, um, so either you directly define a notion of dependent pre-sheaf over gamma, or if you're a mathematician who's not used to working in an indexed way, you would say a type is a map from some other object delta into gamma in pre-sheaves. And then you have to worry about um, interpreting substitution in a strictly functorial way, um, which is possible. But, um, I chose this definition um, for a reason, and we will see it shortly. So um, I also write A is a type in context gamma as, well, one of these notations. And I agree it's a bit confusing, but I couldn't decide which one I wanted to use. I, I need a better notation for, for um, index, for, for displayed discrete vibrations. I kind of want to give this map the name of A, and maybe the total space should be called gamma.A. But um, if I call this gamma dot A, I, I need to call the map uh, P of A. So P of A would be the same thing as A, which I also want to avoid because it's not actually the map. It's the, uh, you know, the displayed thing um, with its indexing information. 
Okay. And uh, the terms are just sections of this, or if you want, uh, dependent sections of dependent pre-sheaves. And now, um, well, you can guess this uh, top object is the uh, context extension. So the pre-sheaf gamma extended with the dependent pre-sheaf A over gamma. And uh, a nice joke in the Zoom chat, by the way, by PMP. Um, so um, the reason why I chose this uh, slightly weird or non-standard definition is um, to make you recognize that we can actually simplify this model quite a bit by um, moving away from pre-sheaf models to a different base category. So we can say the base category of our model is actually uh, categories, the one category of categories. And we can build a category with families from that by saying that the type, the types over a category um, are the sets of, is the set of discrete vibrations over this category. This is kind of suggested already in this definition here, because all we need to change is, well, a type now depends on a category. And then instead of the category of elements of gamma, we just use this category. So again, context are categories, types are discrete, uh, discrete vibrations in displayed forms, and context extension is given by taking the uh, total category, the actual category of elements um, in the non-indexed presentation. So forming the sigma type basically. And uh, this makes it quite a bit nicer. And then the actual pre sheaf models over a fixed category C would be obtained by passing to a slice of this um, CWF of categories um, with discrete vibrations as types. So the pre sheaf model over C is the slice model over C. Okay, and um, well, how do we interpret type formers? And I didn't actually spell out everything here because that was not supposed to be the focus of the talk, but I left it as exercises. Only we already had the exercise session and you did another exercise, which is also beneficial. So we can leave this for the second exercise session if we have time for it. Um, I give some very high level ideas here for how to actually interpret the type formers, but these are not these are not full definitions. So these are just sketches. And if you want to learn how the pre sheaf model actually works, you there's no other way than to get your hands dirty and uh, do the details yourself. But um, what I wanted to say is that sigma and identity types are not surprising. They are just interpreted point wise, level wise. So for every object of the base category, you you um, independently take the sigma type or identity type and unit types work like that as well. And uh, for pi and the universe, it's a bit more complicated. And my way or the way that I like to understand this as a category theorist, apologies for the people who are more or closer to category theory, uh, to, to type theory than to category theory is as follows. So um, before we had this uh, Grotten deconstruction which embedded pre-sheaves uh, fully faithfully into categories over C. So again, pre-sheaves over C are just contravariant functors from C up to Z. And by taking the category of elements, we obtain a larger category than C, which has as objects pairs of an object of C and then an element of the pre-sheaf at that object. And this larger co category lives over the category C by the first projection. And when I write this, I, I want to regard this category really as being indexed over C, so it's a displayed category. Uh, we can do the same thing for graphs, which is actually easier than for categories. So any category has an underlying graph. And by a graph, I just mean um, basically the structure of a category without any operations. So just a set of objects and set of morphisms between any two objects. And um, it just so happens that if we start with pre sheaves and embed into graphs over C, we still obtain a fully faithful functor. So graphs, displayed graphs over C, are sufficient to record the structure of, um, of a pre-sheaf. And there are various adjunctions here, and we will be interested in the right adjoints. It turns out that you can um, recover pi types in the pre-sheaf model by well, you have types A and B, let's say. You look at them and move via this functor to graphs over the base category. Um, 
And in graphs, pi types are quite easy to compute. Um, so graphs are actually a special case of a pre-shift category, but you can ignore this for now. Suffice to say that um, an exponential, let's say, in graphs is just computed. Um, well, it's computed independently on the object. So you take an exponential on the objects. And for the morphisms, you take a dependent exponential where you have to first quantify also over the two endpoints before you quantify over the, uh, the morphism. So, um, and then you, you apply um, a, the, uh, the endpoints of um, the given element of the pi type to the, the endpoints that you quantified over to get to the, uh, the endpoints of the result that you need. Um, so I would have liked this to be another exercise, but I probably can see that this would take too much time. So um, maybe you can do this uh, if you have time at some point after the talk. So pi types, I see as follows. You move to graphs over C, you do the pi type here, and then you apply the right adjoint, which you can also see as a co-reflection operation. Um, so this witnesses pre-sheaves as being co-reflectively embedded into graphs over C. And uh, you can do the same trick for the universe. Um, if we are just thinking about categories over C, there is actually a natural candidate for the universe. So the, the universe should be an object which, which classifies small pre-sheaves or pre-sheaves which at every level live in the given universe and set. And the canonical way of constructing a category over C which has this classification property but is not corresponding to a pre-sheaf is to just take the category of sets and well, re-index it to C constantly. So it's just uh, the, the displayed category over C, which is constantly set at every position. And then uh, we transport it to actual pre-sheaves by co-reflection, by applying the right adjoint. So you can also think of this as discrete vibrations being co-reflectively co embedded into categories over C. And we apply the, the co-reflection, the right adjoint to the embedding. Uh, to define the universe in here. And if you unfold all the details, you actually discover that you just get another description of the hoffmann streicher universe, which you may or may not be familiar with. But I think that this is a nice way of understanding the hoffmann streicher universe, which um, explains some of the ad hoc um, choices in the definition and the same for pi types. But um, we don't have time to, to do these details um, now. So that's how much I wanted to say about general pre-shift models, because the main topic of the talk is going to be um, models of hot. And um, I'm just wondering whether another break is in order or not. Let me check the schedule. Um, I suppose formally, yes, but. Yeah. Okay. This was three pages of material, but it was extremely dense. So let's take Yeah. So let's take a break and then we do the simplicial set session without a break. So let's resume at um, is 15 minutes after four enough? What do the organizers say? Okay, good. So a short break, um, just short of 10 minutes. We resume at uh, 15 minutes after four. And in the meantime, I'm available, of course, to answer any of your questions about uh, the pre sheaf model. Maybe I should take a look at the Zoom questions. There was a quite an involved discussion. Okay, so most of the discussion was about system F. 
So everything I said about system F was just about what it means to be a model of system F. I did not claim that set is a, or that a particular invitational set is a model of, of a system F. How do you type in those symbols when using Linux? Well, I don't know how the other people do it, but I use Acta sometimes, and Acta has a, has a mode for in, inputting Unicode characters. So I just use the same input mode for writing Unicode text and then copy it. But uh, now that I mentioned it, I noticed that this is probably an embarrassing information.
Okay, 50 minutes after, and uh, I guess it's time to continue. Yep. So I have to finish um, before, um, well, to give you time to have a pause before um, Valerie's talk. So depending on how long this portion of the talk takes, oh, uh, okay. Um, we might only have a very short exercise session or in the worst case, we might not have an exercise session, but uh, let's see. Um, please don't take this as, um, as an instruction not to ask any questions during the talk. I'm happy to answer any questions and it will likely increase everyone's understanding if, if someone asks a question. Okay, so um, I actually, decided to take the break too early because there was one more slide about pre-shift models, but I already mentioned this. Uh, so if we now have this interpretation of type theory, extensional type theory, so with equality reflection into pre-shifts, we can actually go back and revisit our description of type formats in CWFs. And if uh, C is our CWF, we can describe everything, pi types, sigma types, identity types, internally to pre-sheaves over C to avoid always having to mention the context gamma and naturality under substitution in gamma. So um, internally in pre-sheaves over C um, type is, well, it's a type in the empty context and term is a type depending on a variable of the type TY. It gets confusing now with these uh, capital TY being the, uh, the types of the CWF and the types here just being the pre sheaf types. And um, then I can phrase the, the rules for it for type formats just by, you know, doing the natural thing, so to say. So this is exactly the same as what I wrote for pi types, only that I don't have to speak about the context gamma anymore because I already work internally to pre-sheaves over C. So instead of saying gamma is an object of C, A is an element of types over gamma, and B is an element of type over gamma to A, I can just say, a is a type, and all of this is interpreted in pre sheaves so I can instantiate it at every level gamma. And then whenever I have a context extension, I just do a quantification over terms of A. And then if I were to evaluate this at context at level gamma, then um, the exponential can actually just be implemented by evaluating whatever comes as the domain at level gamma dot A or whatever type I have here. In, in the term parenthesis. Um, if you unfold it directly with a standard interpretation of pi types, you get something like um, B is a family of types and context delta uh, for every substitution from delta into gamma for which A when substituted along the substitution happens to have a term. But you can also directly phrase it as just a single B using context extension as we did before. And then this isomorphism is also internal to pre sheaves So everything is internal. The definition becomes a bit shorter because we don't have to mention gamma and naturality. And we explain what type formats mean using type theory. So it's a bit circular, but uh, it's nicer. Um, right. Okay. So that was pre shift models and some use of pre shift models. But now we come to the actual use of pre shift models. And to make things a bit more concrete, we are going to look at a particular case and explicitly see what being a pre-sheaf means in that case. So this will help you if you haven't worked with pre-sheaf categories before. So uh, this part, and it's the main part of this talk, I suppose, is about simplicial sets, part three. Um, simplicial sets as a model of thought, but before we can attempt to do this, we need to you know, develop some preliminaries about simplicial sets. and. Uh, one such preliminary is developing intuition for simplicial sets, how they look like. And it's basically a combinatorial model for spaces where we, we do away with topologies, we do away with infinitesimal things like the unit interval. Um, we, we do away with all these countably infinite points in the interval, whatever, uh, uncountably infinitely many points. Uh, we just um, represent shapes combinatorially or discreetly if you want by saying we have a collection of points, we have a collection of edges, which are directed. We have a collection of triangle fillers. 
Um, so the scan decided to make the inside of this white, but when I drew it, I made it gray. So the white balancing of the scanner is not quite uh, quite uh, right. And uh, we can have simplices of high dimension. So this is supposed to be a tetrahedron. So four points, six lines, four triangle fillers, and an inside. You could also have a tetrahedron without the inside, but here I wanted it to have an insight. And here's another line, another line. And here's something interesting, a line which has the same start and end point. That's also a lot. We can have isolated points, we can have isolated lines, any kinds of pastings or gluings of these primitive simplices. And interestingly, we can also decide to let a line be degenerate. So what that means is that we regard it as just a single point blown up to look like a line. So it's kind of like a constant path in homotopy type theory. So for any point, there is automatically a line which is constantly that point. And also for simplices and high dimensions. So for every point, there is a triangle which is constantly that point, so to say. And it's called the degenerate version of that point in high dimensions. There's also a version of simplicial sets without these degeneracies, and people call them semi-simplicial sets, but that's not what this talk is about. So is a degenerate the, line different from a loop? Um, a degenerate line is a loop in particular, but not all loops are degenerate lines because it could be that the loop is, a, is an actual loop. Mm -hmm, but good question. So here are again the basic geometric shapes, so points, lines, triangles, and a tetrahedra, and so on and so on. I don't know a name for the four-dimensional simplex, but I just tend to call them four simplex, and so on. And importantly, um, the points and all of these things, they are ordered. There's a total order of points. There is also a way of doing simplicial sets without this ordering, and those would be called symmetric simplicial sets. But um, People don't know how to build a model of hot for those things that is equivalent to, to spaces. Okay, so these are the simplices written delta n in dimension n, and they actually form a category. So these are the objects, and what are the morphisms between the objects? Well, we want to have face morphisms, which means we want to be able to regard a point as being, for example, the start point or the end point of a line. We want to be able to regard a line as being one of the three lines in a boundary of a triangle, and so on and so on. So in order to capture these relations, we need to add maps into the category of simplices that exhibit these face relations. And we can do this in a very elegant way by just saying that the category of simplices is the category of inhabited finite total orders. Or if you prefer to work with an explicit skeleton, it's, uh, it's a subcategory of posets, a full subcategory of posets, which contains only those posets which are of the form, and I write it square bracket n. Um, and these are the posets which are just linear sequences of, let's say, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on until n. And there needs to be at least uh, one element in here. So I say n is at least 0. And then, of course, um, this poset is going to correspond to the n-dimensional simplex. And the maps in this category are maps of posets, so they have to preserve the ordering. And if I want to have a face map from a point to, let's say, a line which sends this point to the start point, I would choose the map from the poset with just 0 to the poset with 0 less than 1, which sends 0 to 0. And if I wanted to select the endpoint, I would send 0 to 1. So in this way, I can model the phase relations using injective order preserving maps. So if I want to, for example, select the line 0, 2 in a triangle, I would look at the map from square bracket 1 to square bracket 2, which sends 0 to 0 and 1 to 2. So 1 is omitted. And um, well, there are not just injections in this category, there are also surge actions. And the surge actions are responsible for giving the degeneracies. So square bracket zero is the post set with a single object. So it's actually the terminal post set. There's a unique map from any other post set to that post set. And that means that um, 
there is a unique map from any n simplex to the point, and that represents this degeneracy that I can see every point also as a line or triangle or tetrahedron, which I think of as being constant on that point. And the formal definition of simplicia sets based on this category of simpl simplices is uh, simply as presheaves over this category of simplices. So three notations here. Usually we we'll, we'll just write simplicia set. And uh, now we go back to the definition of presheaves, the standard one, at, let's say at first, where a presheaf is a contravariant functor from delta to set. So if you uh, look at the uh, generating phase maps and degeneracy maps, so for example, for the phase maps, the phase inclusions, which always just omit one point in every map. And then you look at the action of a simplicial set, let's say X on it, then because X is a contravariant functor from delta to set, all these lines, they go into the opposite direction. So for example, we have two maps from square bracket zero to square bracket one, which select the two endpoints. And then by contravariance, we obtain two maps from the set of lines in X to the set of points in X, which are the maps that select the first endpoint of a line or the second endpoint of a line. And uh, similarly in dimension, in dimension uh, higher, one higher, we have um, three interesting injective maps from square bracket one to square bracket two, which kind of represent the three faces here. And if I look at the contravariantly functorial action of X on these three maps, I get three maps backwards from X2, from the set of triangles to the set of lines, which, which give me these three lines for every triangle in X. So the faces of the triangle, so to say. So a face is just one of these uh, three lines in this case, or a face of a tetrahedron would be one of these four triangles. The face of a line would be one of these two points. And well, a point, point doesn't have a face. And then, well, the degeneracy maps go into the opposite direction. So as you can see, for every point, I get a line, which is the degenerate line on X0. And if you compute, uh, then according to the relations in this category that hold amongst the morphisms, if I go back via the first or second endpoint to X0, I would get back the same element I started with. So that, that witness is exactly what, what, what was asked about before, that a degeneracy or a degenerate line is actually also a loop on the given point. So this is a concrete p shift category. And this is how I think about it in my mind. It's just some gluing of, of, uh, of these representables of these basic geometric shapes, so to say. So this gluing can be made precise. Another way of phrasing pre shift categories is as a free co-completion of the given category. And the free co-completion can be thought of as taking co-limits. So gluing or building up from geometric shapes is just like taking co-limits. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions? I suppose the ordering could be partial as long as endpoints are always ordered. Um, that would give rise to a different geometric model, but maybe you could also use that model to, to talk about spaces. Um, I don't know, but it would not be simplicial sets anymore. Okay, so I like simplicial sets very much and I expect you to do the same. Okay. Um, homotopical structure on simplicial sets. So now we're getting close at the goal. We, we don't just want the pre-shift category. We want some homotopy theory on it. Ignore it if you don't know what it means. Uh, basically, it's what is going to describe the types in the model. And for this, we um, introduce some very fundamental uh, simplicial sets. And they're actually very, very intuitive. So you don't have to understand the formal mathematics. You can just picture them in your head assuming that you can visualize n-dimensional geometry. And I can only do this up to dimension two, so I have to understand the mathematics, unfortunately. So the boundary of an n-simplex is the simplicial set which contains everything in an n-simplex except the inside. So a point doesn't have a boundary. 
the boundary of a line is just the two points. The boundary of a field triangle, and suddenly here the shading worked, is just the three lines glued together at the uh, endpoints, but without the inside. That's the boundary. And then the horn, well, actually there are many horns in dimension n. It's indexed by a number k. It's like the boundary, but it misses also one of the faces. And there's a tradition in which you index the faces according to which point is missing in the face. So the kth face is the face that only includes the points 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on without k. And there is also a side condition that horns only exist in dimension 1 and higher. So the lowest two horns are the inclusion of the 0 point into the line 0, 1, and the 1 point into the line 0, 1. And then one dimension higher, we have three horns, and they start to look like horns and also like lambdas. Um, actually, there is a typo in this. Um, this delta should have been a capital lambda so that it looks like a horn. So I will fix this later, but the bottom line here should be missing. Um, yeah, so as you can see, the inside is missing, but also one of the faces is missing. And I can all already tell you a spoiler. Uh, namely that filling horns in simplicial sets is kind of like a composition operation for paths. So for example here, for 0, 1, 2, filling this horn or being able to fill this horn in a simplicial set would kind of mean that we are able to compose paths, right? Given a path from 0 to 1 and a path from 1 to 2, we obtain a path from 0 to 2. And then the insight is kind of a witness that the line we get from 0 to 2 is actually related to the sequence of the previous paths. So um, yeah, so this clearly models some kind of composition operation. So if you know about groupoids, then you can see this as or categories. This is composition categories. And the other two horns, they only exist if the category is a groupoid. OK. And we are going to use these, um, these key simplicial sets to define some, some homotopical structure. Um, which is just a certain class of or certain classes of maps in simplicial sets. So what we're going to do now is say, and I'm just going to give the intuition. You don't have to read the formal mathematics, or you can do that later if you want. Um, a map y to x called p is a trivial vibration if it lifts against boundary inclusions. And lifting means that in any commutative square where the left map is a boundary inclusion and the right map is the map P, there exists a diagonal filler which makes the diagram commute. But uh, what this means geometrically is that, well, we follow Andre's pictures and draw a bubble for X in the bottom and a bubble for Y in the top. If we are given an N simplex in X, for example, a line, and then in Y, we are given a partial lift of this n simplex, which is not defined on the entirety, but only on the boundary. So in this case, the two points y0 and y1. Then we are able to find a line between y0 and y1, which lives over the line in x. So this is for dimension 1. And in dimension 0, it would mean for any point x, we can find a point y over it. And if you think about type theory, then this is kind of like inhabitation. Um, for every point in the, con in the context, we can find a, a point in the type over that uh, point in the context. And this is like, um, this is like um, well, um, any two points being merely connected by a path, or there is merely a path between, or I don't know, uh, connectivity, zero connectivity. Um, no, zero. I always minus one. I always get the indices mixed up. Anyway, um, connected up to mere existence of path. Um, so when you write in type theory that any two points are connected by a line, it actually means more than the same thing here, because any statement in type theory is automatically natural in whatever arguments you have. So if you say for any two points, a line, it's actually natural in the two points. And this lifting condition doesn't say anything about naturality in, in these two points. It turns out, in fact, that the higher lifting conditions for higher n 
encode exactly this kind of naturality or coherence, if you wish. And it is for this reason that these trivial vibrations will actually model the contractible types in homotopy type theory. So a contractible type, as Andre has defined, is a type which has a center and every other point is equal to it. So we have a function which takes another point and returns a path between the center of contraction and the given point. Because it's an internal statement of type theory, this is actually a uniform choice, uh, which is kind of continuous, so to say. So if you move this other point, this path that you get also moves continuously. That's the intuition. And this continuity in this combinatorial model corresponds to coherence up to a higher n simplices, which is encoded by these higher lifting conditions. Mm -hmm. All right. And then we have a slightly more complicated notion of Kahn vibration, which is the same kind of thing, but only um, expressed via lifting against horn inclusions as opposed to boundary inclusions. So now we can fill partial horns that are already filled in the base. So given a line and given a lift of the first point, we can find a lift of the rest. And this begins to look like a transport operation where this is the transport and this is kind of the witness that relates the transport of the original thing over the given path. And um, the same thing in high dimensions. So this is a two dimensional horn and you can kind of think of this two dimensional horn as expressing some, some kind of coherence of transport. And that if the two original paths are related somehow by this path between paths that keeps the first endpoint fixed, then also the lifts are going to be related. And it actually does not depend on the lifts that you have chosen. So you will always be able to find this. It turns out um, this condition in all dimensions encodes exactly that, so that you can have transport, as we will see later on, at least classically. And these will interpret the types. And that's the basic intuition of the model. And I talked quite a bit about just this slice because the intuition is important. So if you have any questions, about horns, boundaries, or what they mean geometrically, now is the right time to, to ask, I suppose. I don't know how many of you were actually familiar already with simplicial sets before, but uh, I don't assume that you are, so don't worry. That's exactly why I, I included this, uh, this slide, this page. OK. Um, Let's move on. So, um, yeah. Um, weak factorization systems. Okay, I'm not going to go over all of this material. It's a categorical background, but you don't have to know it. The reason why I put it here was because of these lifting diagrams. So these lifting diagrams they also feature in what people call weak factorization systems. So in general, if you have a category C, a weak factorization system consists of classes of maps L and R such that, well, why is it called a weak factorization system? It's because every map can be factored using a factor in L followed by a factor in R. And then L and R are actually characterized by each other by lifting conditions. R is exactly the class of maps which lift against L and L is exactly the class of maps which lift against R. And this is an extremely useful concept. And whenever you have such a thing, then these classes of maps L and R are actually closed under very, very many operations that we won't go through. Um, this notion becomes even nicer if you replace this um, existential for a lift by a unique existential. And in that case, you obtain the notion of factorization system, which, um, which actually also features quite a bit in um, homotopy type theory. So for example, I mean, you haven't seen this yet, but maybe Eckbert will at one point mention it. There is a factorization system of um, n-connected and n-truncated maps, for example. And there's an entire theory of, of factorization systems and left exact uh, factorization systems, which is extremely important, but a bit more advanced than what we're going to cover in this, in this school. And uh, there are also minor differences between factorization systems and just ordinary one category theory as here. And well, higher categories um, or the higher category of spaces. 
um, which is what you would do in hot. And um, paradoxically, the higher theory tends to be nicer in general. Um, yeah, there are various generalizations of these algebraic weak factorization systems, fibered algebraic weak factorization systems, but we are not going to go into these here because these will only play a role once we switch to the cubical set model. Uh, what's important for us is that there are actually very general theorems which um, construct such weak factorization systems for free, basically. All we have to give them is uh, some set of um, generators um, and a nice enough category. So um, is the upside down size some category theory notation? Um, right, L upside down psi, it's a pitch, it's a pitchfork actually. R means that L lifts against R. So it means whenever you put, whenever you have a commutative square where you put a map in L on the left and a map on R on the right, you obtain, or it is possible to obtain a lift. That's what the, the pitchfork means. I don't know who came up with this notation. It's completely arbitrary, right? I think maybe the pitchfork is like splitting the triangle in two, some, uh, sorry, the square into two triangles. So, so you can think of it as, as that, I suppose. It's just category theory notation for, for uh, lifting, but it's what I just explained, nothing else, nothing. Yeah, there's nothing else to it. And that's also why the uh, um, right lifting closure and left lifting closure. So, so taking all the maps that lift on the right or lift on the left against a given class is to denoted by, by this operation, pitchfork on the right or pitchfork on the left. And this actually forms an adjunction on classes of maps, but let's not get into this. Okay, so um, this was one excursion, but unfortunately I have to do one more excursion before we can uh, treat the model of hot in simplicia sets. But this one is quite a bit more exciting. So it's uh, actually the secret source of homotopy theory and uh, people don't want you to know about it. So you should be happy that I tell you about it. Um, this is what's behind many fancy constructions in homotopy theory. And once you understand this construction, then suddenly many other constructions lose their mysteriousness and become much, much more accessible to analysis. And of course, I'm talking about the uh, calculus of pushout and pullback constructions. So this is a very general theory, which basically takes a functor f, let's say in two variables from uh, c times d to e, and produces another functor, which operates on the arrow categories. And well, I'm just going to give the definition on objects. And I'm also going to do it by example, because I believe the examples convey more intuition. So let's look at the product by functor. So the product functor on C, if C has products, and you can suppose it's just sets or simplicial sets, goes from C times C to C. So the, the push out product is the following operation. It takes a map from A to B as left argument, as a map and a map um, G here from C to D as a right argument, and it needs to return another map. And how does it construct this map? Well, it kind of takes the, uh, the map F and the map G and applies the product to all possible combinations of source and target. So source and source, which is A times C, source and target, target and source, and target and target. And by functorality, we obtain a commutative square. And then we can take the pushout and obtain an induced map from the pushout. And it is that map, which is the pushout product. It looks complicated at first glance, but it has so many nice properties, you won't believe it. Um, yeah. So sometimes you do the same, but with pullbacks. So for example, for the pullback exponential, you kind of do the same thing. There are some issues with contravariance here for the exponential, but you take the pullback, which of course you can regard as a pushout in the opposite category. So in principle, there's a way of reducing it to the pushout construction, um, but it's incredibly magic. So any property you know that your functor F has, most cases, it will lift to this um, F hat, to this pushout construction or pullback construction of F. If F is the product functor of a monoidal category, then you obtain a lifted monoidal category structure on the arrow category. Um, if your functor F was co-continuous in 
in an argument, it will remain so after this push out or pullback construction. Um, is this a, an example of uh, the join of two maps? I mean, yes, in yeah, fact. Okay. So um, the join is actually a special case of the push out product where you have B and D, the terminal object, and um, you can interdefine the push up product from the join of maps. And reversely, you can define um, the join of maps from the push up product. So um, it's, yeah, I believe this construction features under many different names. I guess the join of maps is exactly this. I don't know, maybe Eckbert can correct me. Um, I don't know what else I could do with two maps when I do the join other than doing this construction. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. So what Eckbert is saying is um, basically the reduction of the push-up product to the ordinary join. So um, in homotopy type theory, the fibers of this map can be characterized as just the fibers of um, well, the fiber of this map join the fiber of this map, and um, you can also express it. You can also express the join as um, as um, well the push-up product into the terminal object. So this witness is basically some sort of stability of the push-up product under reindexing, um, which is not so surprising because um, I suppose all involved operations are. But maybe there's more to it. I don't remember. Um, right, let's continue. So yeah, it preserves composition vertical here. I don't mean that the functor f hat preserves composition. That's always the case because it's a functor. I mean that if I compose two objects vertically here, um, so the objects are already mapped, so I can compose them. I obtain also composition of maps in E arrow, at least up to a push out or pullback. Um, but these are details that we don't have time to examine. And the amazing thing is that this um, push out or pullback construction interacts extremely nicely with the lifting property. So whenever I have an injunction, for example, of um, fx on the left and gx on the right, where x varies, so this is actually a family of injunctions in next over x, then the push out constructions, um, well, they will be adjoined as well. But furthermore, um, left lifting a push out construction against another map H is the same thing as right lifting the dual pullback construction from the right against the original argument G. So I can transpose um, these um, F hat and G hat whenever I have a lifting uh, relation. I can turn the left adjoint push out construction into a right adjoint push out pullback construction on the right. And this is what's featuring. Um, secretly in the construction of many of these models of hot in, in cubical or simplicial sets, and also everywhere else, um, also in factorization systems in in hot, or if you work with n connected and n truncated maps, there is a lot of calculations that, well, using orthogonality instead of lifting, but in a higher setting, so it's a bit more complicated. Okay, so now we have all the preliminaries to to finish um, and. I hope I can do this in the given time. Um, so by this very general theorem, which gives us weak factorization systems for free, we can take the boundary inclusions and get a weak factorization system of so-called co-fibrations and trivial fibrations. So once again, trivial fibrations are given by lifting against boundary inclusions. And co-fibrations, you can kind of think as the saturation of boundary inclusions. It's all the maps that you can get by iteratively composing pushouts of boundary inclusions, essentially. And the same for horn inclusions, only we call the left class trivial co-fibrations. And if you know about model categories, then you will know this. This forms the so-called model structure, the Kahn or Kahn-Quillen model structure on simplicial sets. Um, yeah, there are um, much more examples of weak factorization systems also in simpler categories like sets, but we don't have the time right now to 
treat this topic in more detail. Um, and then, um, and now we are going to go back to the secret sauce of homotopy theory. There's a, an extremely important lemma that relates lifting against horns against lifting against boundary inclusions in a certain way. And this lemma says, and I'm not going to prove it, that horn inclusions and push out products of endpoint inclusions and boundary inclusions, they in fact generate the same weak factorization system. And uh, what this essentially means is that we can characterize vibrations, which are defined by lifting against horn inclusions, also by lifting against this right class or set of maps. And because the left class that we lift against here is a push up product, as we just discussed, we can turn the lifting relation around and apply the dual right adjoint, or rather its pullback version of it, um, to the right to express um, a lifting condition which has only boundary inclusions on the left. And that's what I did here. So, okay, being a vibration is the same as lifting against horn inclusions by the lemma. It's the same as lifting as against uh, push up products of interval endpoint inclusions and um, boundary inclusions. And when I say interval, I just mean the line with um, interval endpoints zero and one. I think of this as an interval connecting zero and one. And then I transpose, I, I use that the product with the fixed, um, fixed uh, left argument is uh, left adjoint to the exponential with that um, argument. And um, using the uh, push out pullback version of it, this lifting condition is the same as just lifting boundary inclusions against the pullback exponential of P with these endpoint inclusions. And lifting against the boundary inclusion is the same as being a trivial vibration. So what I get in the end is that the pullback exponential of P with um, the inclusions of zero and one into the line is a trivial vibration. And if you want to um, eliminate the symbol, here I've written down what this map evaluates to in categorical notation. So this bottom object here is a pullback. This is a notation for a pullback over X or a fiber product over X. And uh, this gives a description of vibrations which exclusively depends on trivial vibrations and the structure of an interval. So we completely eliminated horns. And this is the first step in not just understanding the simplicial model, but also cubical models because Cubical models are based on cubes as opposed to simplices, but cubes still have an interval because the line from zero to one is also a cube in dimension one. So we still have access to an interval and we can define uh, vibrations from trivial vibrations in this way, assuming that we have some notion of trivial vibration, which is in fact defined a bit differently for cubical sets, not just using boundary fillers. Um, and in the Cartesian cubical set model, there's a minor variation to it, which I, which I won't go into. Um, actually, you can also build the groupoid model by, by following this um, approach. So the circuit source here is, is really this, this push-up product construction. Push-up products of interval endpoint inclusions with, with um, boundary inclusions. And um, since this is a set level construction, instead of being related to the join as it would be in in homotopy type theory, it's related to the set level join of, um, well, in fact, these are, well, the fibers of these things are propositions. So the set level join of propositions is also called the disjunction. And you can express this operation using disjunctions, which, um, which you will see when we use the internal language to talk about cubical type theory, um, for example, in, in, uh, in Understock, I believe. So, this push up product models a disjunction, basically. The disjunction of being over zero or one um, or being in the given boundary of the simplex. Okay. Um, oh, yes. The Anil Biedermann Finster Jayal is also a very, very elegant example of the use of this push out pullback product exponential calculus to to do something um, interesting and to actually give a, a better proof than all previous known proofs of a certain theorem. Um, how do we get the groupoid model? Glad that you ask so that I can spend my time talking about it. 
Um, so for the groupoid model, you choose as instead of boundary inclusions, you choose a different set of uh, co-fibrations you or generating co-fibrations. So you choose um, as co-fibrations those functors between groupoids which are injective on objects but arbitrary on morphisms. So classically speaking in simplicial sets, the co-fibrations, the things that you can build using boundary inclusions, they're actually exactly the monomorphisms. This is not true constructively. But in, uh, in groupoids, you have to look at the functors which are monomorphisms only on objects. And then you get the vibrations using this definition. So defining a vibration using, um, well, by saying that this pullback exponential is a trivial vibration. Um, when I tried the two groupoid, yeah, I tried with this kind of stuff, but I didn't get anywhere. It's also quite hard to make the algebraic models for n groupoids be one categories, which is what you need in the first place to, to model type theory. For two groupoids, you can still do it, but I don't know how to interpret pi types. Um, all right. Um, finally, and after all preliminaries, we can reap the fruits of our labors, um, if you're still listening, that is, and um, try to see Simplicial Set as a model of hot. So, as I said, um, Simplicial Sets are a pre-shift category over delta. And as, as we've seen in the previous part, um, there is an interpretation of extensional Martin of type theory, so with equality reflection in it. And we are basically going to use it. We are just modifying some components. So the types before were just um, displayed, let's say, displayed pre sheaves, dependent pre sheaves, or if you want, a pre sheaves with a forgetful map into the base, but then you have to worry about um, strictness of substitutions. So here I said, okay, we write it as the display map, but what we mean is this is supposed to be indexed over, over gamma. So I mean a notion of dependent pre sheaf that I'm not going to unfold here. Uh, this was the notion of types in the pre sheaf model. And what we now do is we add a second component. We say we restrict to Kahn vibrations. And there are two possible choices here, depending on what you want to do. If you're a classical mathematician, it's not so relevant. You can choose to include um, a witness for the map P being a Kahn vibration, which includes actual data. Um, so the operation that produces the lifts against horn inclusions, for example. Or you can be proof relevant and treat this as a proposition or as a truncate, as a trunk as the truncation of the previous thing, if you want. Or well, there are various ways of doing it, but it's it's not so important. Um, Wojewski did it in the proof relevant way, but you can get slightly more constructive by being proof relevant, but constructivity issues still remain. Um, okay, and we still have access to all the uh, type formers of the underlying pre sheaf model. And the only thing we have to do for the type formers or for most of the type formers is to, to justify for the type judgment that we actually obtain a vibration, a Kahn vibration. So the term operations for dependent sums and de dependent products, they're just interpreted as before, nothing changes. We just have to justify that pi and sigma, for example, are vibrations. And we've already seen that the display map of a sigma type is actually just the composition of the display maps of the two individual types. So this follows by closure of vibrations under composition which is one of these closure properties of weak factorization systems or classes in a weak factorization system that we talked about. And um, path types, um, well, this looks complicated, but actually what I've done here is just um, given a type A, I look at the display map from gamma dot A to A, and I take the so-called Let's, let's call it pullback cotensor over gamma of this map with the boundary inclusion. So the boundary part here is cut off, unfortunately, when I scanned with the boundary inclusion of the interval of delta one. You can reduce this to an ordinary pullback exponential. 
And I drew this diagram so that you can see how it looks like if you don't use any fancy pullback or push out functors. You can construct everything categorically by taking pullbacks and exponentials like this. What it is, is just, well, the path type is basically a path in gamma.a such that when you project down to a path in gamma, you obtain the constant path. So this is, uh, this is just given by the degeneracy map on, you know, we can map a, a line to a point. Um, and um, well, the two endpoints should um, be the chosen endpoints. So that's how you define path types. Essentially, if you're in the empty context, it's just exponentiation with the line with delta one. And if gamma is not empty, then well, you have to do some reindexing. Um, Constructively speaking, this does not actually justify um, the beta rule for J. It turns out you can only justify it up to path. So it's a weak identity type. Um, that's why I called it path types. And if you actually want identity types, then, well, there are several options. And the one that Wojewodski chose in his original presentation of this model was the following. You still use the path types as the actual identity types, but, um, you construct the J elimination in a certain way. So using classical logic, we can show that every monomorphism is a co-fibration. So this is something we're going to talk about briefly later. And any co-fibration, which is a so-called strong deformation retract, so this is a technical thing that you don't have to follow now, is actually a trivial co-fibration. And if we know that the reflexivity map is a trivial co-fibration, and we are given a motive T um, against which we want to eliminate, then this is categorically speaking the diagram and the lifting condition that we have to produce. So we, we had this diagram earlier already, and it is actually just the categorical diagram that corresponds to um, what you did in the first exercise for the elimination rule, if you, if you did that. It just says, okay, we have a motive T and we don't quite have a section of T but we have a section of T when we restrict along the reflexivity map. So that's this D, that's the witness that T holds for reflexivity whenever we substitute reflexivity for the path here. That's what the left map here does. It's just the reflexivity map. So whenever we have that, we can extend the witness um, to a full section. And in fact, as you can see, this is just a lifting problem. And that's the whole point of the digression about weak factorization systems. And in particular, the weak factorization system about of, of trivial cofibrations and fibrations. Um, trivial cofibrations lift against fibrations, so we get the J. The only problem, and it's a very subtle one, is that this is not actually substitution stale, which is necessary for a model. And uh, so you have to be clever about it and use a certain technique for solving this problem. And the technique that Wojewodski used is to form a so-called universal context, which um, models, which includes components for everything that appears in this diagram and choose this diagonal filler in the universal situation and then define all these individual instances of J by restriction. There are some subtleties in here and there's actually something that is being used here, which I'm skipping over, namely that trivial cofibrations are closed in a pullback along fibrations. But that's the idea. And then we, we have actually justified identity types from path types. OK, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip over a lot of material now. So there's another approach which you can read about by Andrew Swan. Uh, dependent products follow from closure of trivial cofibrations and a pullback along fibrations. This is an adjointness argument, um, once again. And I will. I will direct you, I will upload some references where you can read the details if you're interested, or you can talk to me tomorrow. Um, this bit is a bit important. So this addresses the question of why the simplicial set model is actually not constructive. Why is it classical? What's the problem of doing it constructively? And um, the problem is that in pi types, although we didn't go through it, one of the crucial assumptions was that or is that um, a certain object, gamma.a here, is co-fibrant. That's what's needed to 
take a certain lift here uh, for the vibration from gamma dot A to gamma. And uh, well, what does it mean for an object to be cofibrant? Essentially, it means to be able to build up the object X from filling boundaries because cofibrations are generated by boundary inclusions. And as a representative strategy, you can try to, to first fill in all the points, then fill in all the lines, then fill in all the triangle fillers and so on. And if we had more time, I would have paused now and, and asked you to, to think a little bit about what the problem here is, constructively speaking. But since we don't have time anymore, I'm just going to spoil the answer. The answer is that because we are working with simplicial sets, not just semi-simplicial sets, we also have degeneracies. And whenever we add a point, we actually add more than just a point. We also add the degenerate versions of that point in, in all dimensions. So we actually already have added some lines here, namely the constant lines on every point, which means that when we add the other lines, we need to exclude the degenerate ones. And that means we need to be able to decide for every line if it is a degenerate line, in which case it, it came from a point and we don't need to add it or we, we have it, already have it, or a not, a degeneracy, not a degenerate line, in which case we, we really need to add it. And the same in higher dimensions. So we need to de uh, decide between the degenerate triangles, which are already coming from the lines, and the new triangles. So formally, this means that the map from um, degenerate n simplices plus um, non degenerate n simplices to all n simplices needs to be a bijection, which is a categorical way of saying that degeneracies are decidable. And that's what it means to be cofibrant. And constructively, it's just not true. You can easily construct uh, simplicial sets or even graphs already. If you think of graphs with reflexivity, it's just a truncated version of simplicial sets. Graphs with reflexivity. Uh, you can construct such a graph where it's not decidable whether whether an edge is reflexivity or not. So that's the basic problem. Right, uh, function extensionality. This would have been a nice exercise, but you can do it on your own. Um, so this is actually very nice. Um, just as pi types required us to verify that vibrations are stable under push forward under pi types, so that the pi type is a vibration, what function extensionality means is the same for trivial vibration, that the pi type of a trivially, well, contractible type, so trivial vibration is again a trivial vibration. And again, it follows from an adjointness argument. And well, then there was some material about the universe and why we have the universe and why univalence holds, which would have been the key point of this talk, but um, we don't have time to go into it. And I realize now that this was this was way too much material for just um, for just three hours of session today. So I should not have expected to be able to to cover all this material. What I did was basically I, I looked at the number of slides or the number of pages that Andre had, which was 38, and I multiplied by 75%. And then I said 28. And it seems I'm not quite as fast as, as Andre. So probably I need to improve my you know the flow of information when I lecture a bit so that it comes across quicker. Um, but all of this material is uploaded and you can read it if you want. And I will also upload um, references to pointers in the literature, which do all of this or the original sources where it was first done. In some of these cases, um, later on, we or other people noticed some improvements to the arguments. So some of the arguments have become short and short and shorter. So what is in the literature currently might not be the most elegant or shortest version, um, but you can have quite a lot of fun uh, reading something and then trying to simplify it by yourself. And I don't want to take away the, the fun. So, oh yes, exactly. Uh, next time I'll improve the lecture by speaking faster. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I think I should stop here and we don't have time for an exercise session, but um, 
if you have questions now, we have five minutes to answer questions, and then we have a 15-minute break before the talk by uh, Valerie, which starts at half past five. And uh, yeah, um, other than that, as I said, I'm available also on Discord tomorrow morning in the live chat if you want to discuss anything about models. And I was planning on mentioning a few open problems if you're interested in research, and we can discuss about open problems if you're interested in that, if you already know a bit about the material here. Um, question, what's a good longer, slower form resource to learn about this material? Um, so I have to say, I only know about the research papers which do this, which are also quite condensed. Mm. I don't think anyone has written a textbook which does the simplicial set model. Um, so with simplicial sets, unfortunately also the situation is that to the literature, simplicial sets are a very well-known thing. So whenever you write a research paper about simplicial sets, you don't have the opportunity to explain the intuition behind simplicial sets. So what I would recommend you to do is to read an introductory textbook on simplicial sets, for example, and I can give you pointers to, to one. For example, I know that Emily Real has some very readable notes. And you first try to understand the intuition behind simplicial sets a bit more. And then um, you can try to read one of the um, research papers on the simplicial model on, of HOT. So um, I'm allergic to diagrams then I can't help you. <laughs> um, I'm sorry for causing an allergic reaction to you in this talk, by the way. Um, there are models for high inductive types on simplicial sets. Yes, in fact. So it, it turns out that the same technique that uh, Cocon and co-workers have used to interpret high inductive types in cubical models can actually also be used to interpret them in the simplicial model. It's just that no one has written it out. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm available to go through the details tomorrow if you want, but um, Mike Schumann also has, unfortunately, also a categorical approach to um, to um, models in simplicial sets and simplicial precies, but he also has um, an approach to high inductive types now, which I believe um, settles finally also the question of whether it's possible to interpret uh, hot in uh, infinity topoi, including um, high inductive types, which is necessary, at least push outs to do interesting stuff. Um, thank you for all the pointers to, uh, to simplicial sets and introductions to them, by the way. I will survey them and, and then include a selection on the, the course page. I'm also not aware of everything in the subject, by the way. So everything that I've presented here is just um, my own perspective and what I've learned so far. I, I make no claim that this is a complete exposition or that, that these are all the important aspects to know about. Uh, cubical type theory uses contextual categories or algebraic or something. Well, cubical type theory is a type theory. So by default, it lives on the syntactic side of things. It's, it's a version of type theory that adds more rules, basically. So contextual categories are, uh, well, it's close to syntax, but they are a notion of models. So they live on the semantic side. Mm. You are free to use basically most kinds of models to interpret cubical type theory. I would recommend uh, categories with families, for example, but you can also use contextual categories to interpret it. But your, um, your model needs to support all the features of cubical type theory. So you, you have to adapt CWFs to include interpretations of everything that cubical type theory has. 